on here with this next case study. Um, so what I'm going to look at here is I'm going to look at this case study that I, I didn't have a chance to cover it in a class last week, but it's pretty straightforward. And the reason why I want to, to recap it here is because it leads nicely on to the concept of batch monitoring. So what happened here uh, with this SBR star review design rubber simulation was, uh, this was from Paul Novikos' thesis, which you'll we'll get some more information about that simulation later. What's nice about the simulation is that it helps you verify um, things that you're trying out. So in this case, Paul simulated some good batches and then there were two bad batches simulated. And both batches, both bad batches had the same problem, but the problem showed up at different points in time. And there's five, five Y variables here. So the, the nice thing about the simulation is it allows us to check whether batch monitoring actually works, because we know which batches we should be picking up and we can verify that we actually are. So 53 batches, six variables uh, in the trajectories, and at 200 time steps. So there's no need to align here the data are simulated. Um, and the fact that these trajectories are so close together with very little noise and error indicates also that there is likely the simulation. Now, normally I will stop, I would start on a, on a data analysis of this type by doing a PCA on the, on the X space trajectories. I'll, I would follow that up by doing a PCA on the Y space. And then I would go and do a, a, a batch PLS model, where we've got our batch trajectories unfolded in a very long matrix in the X, and a Y space on the, on the five columns on the lab. But in this case, both PCA models on the X space and on the Y space give the same interpretation as PLS. So I'm going to jump straight to the PLS and just show some of the results here. And I, I won't even go through the software, I'll just go through the screenshots I've got here. What I did is I used two, three components just to understand what's going on. The, the R squared values are shown over there, but what's interesting are the uh, scores. So T1 versus T2 for the batch PLS. Just to, just to recap the last class, what we, what we do is we take our batch data and we unfold it into a very long, thin matrix. Uh, sorry, it's a very wide matrix. N, N rows, one row per batch, and we've got capital K times capital J columns. Okay. So this first set of K columns represents our six variables at time step one. Then the next six columns would be the variables at time step two, all the way up to the time step capital J. And our Y space would represent the five columns. So in this example, we've got five columns of uh, properties measured on the on the 53 batches. Doing a PLS on those, we can, we see that T1, T2 show up two batches as being outlined. No surprise because those are the ones that are simulated as, as being. Um, unsuccessful. So this shows promising, uh, uh, promising results from a monitoring perspective. Because from a monitoring perspective, what we would do is we build our model only on these observations over here. Once the batch is complete, we could do the following. Let's say batch 37 has just finished. We've got all the data on the six variables for the, for the 200 time steps. So we can take those uh, those data and fold them into that um, shape and we can go calculate y hat and we can, uh, well that's jumping ahead, before we would go ahead and calculate y hat we would go calculate t for those, uh, for that new observation by saying t is equal to x times w star and then once we've got the t's we can go calculate y hat. We can also of course calculate sp for this and, and t squared so from a monitoring perspective, this shows some promise because uh, these outliers are so far away from the rest of the data. If I did go exclude those two observations, rebuild the model, and bring observation 34, 37 in as new tested data, they would fall outside the ellipse there on the score plot. 
and we would be able to detect that that batch where it was unusual. We could also go look at the SPE plot. Um, SPE shows nothing was being picked up. Okay, so none, none of the observations really, there's one observation that's slightly out there, but no major problems were picked up. Remember, I must stress here, and this is going to become an important point through the rest of this class today, this is the overall SPE. This is, in other words, treating this purely from an ordinary PLS point of view, where that's my x, I can calculate a T1, T2, SPE, T squared, and here's my y. From an ordinary PLS point of view, this is the SPE. Let's say this is the final row in that batch matrix. These are the SPE values for the entire batch using all trajectories over all times. It's the SPE we end up with at the end. And that, the reason why I'm stressing that point is going to become clear uh, when we start looking at monitoring, where we're going to get time varying SPE. But this is the SPE at the end of the batch, using the entire batch data. One other thing that's interesting to go look at is go look at R squared changing with time through the batch per variable. So there's a lot of information shown on this plot. Let's break it down. The first. <coughs> and lower line, the orange line is the lower line, it's R squared using a single component per variable. So if we take a look at the orange line, here's R squared for reactor temperature, cooling water temperature, reactor jacket temperature. These R squared values on the orange line are pretty small, 10, 20 percent. R squared for latex density and conversion is high. It's, in, it's showing for, to us that as that batch progresses, we're able to explain more and more of the latex density variable through the batch. So initially, at the start of the batch, we really can't explain latex density too well. But as the batch progresses, we're able to better and better explain latex density, better explain conversion. Energy released is also pretty poorly explained. The green line represents R squared using two components. So we're and actually what's interesting, by, by looking at the difference between the orange line and the green line, we get to understand what that second component is actually explaining. So we, we go look for gaps, or delta, delta gaps here, we've seen that the second component explains latex density even more. It's already well explained with one component, but the second component explains even more, maybe in this region <coughs> at, near the start of the batch. Same for conversion. The second component also seems to start explaining energy released at the last half of the batch. Okay, so sometimes these R squared trajectories are also helpful to look at. We could go look at uh, the PLS weights, and I, I won't go interpret those. These are we, we did this all at last class. We we were interpreting loadings and weight plots. Okay. So how we calculated the R squared and the getting the model and the uh, no, remember as the, uh, if we take this, this value, you just calculate R squared for this column, R squared for the next column, and so on. So I'm just, what I'm showing there on that previous plot was the R squared values for one column over, over time. Okay, so there's no, no special extra calculation. I'm just showing, um, it's like looking at R squared in, in an ordinary PLS model, except I've just reordered my columns to be trajectories. Um, what I will look at here though is the contribution plot for batch 37. So batch 37 was an outlier over here in the T1 direction. If we do a contribution on that, we covered this last class, the contribution comes out to be a vector of of call, uh, sorry, vector that's as long as we've got uh, variables and time steps. But for convenience, the software will group the, um, the data up for you by variable. So this is the reactive temperature variable from time zero to time n, time zero to time n for the next variable and so on. And um, because the, the reason why I'm emphasizing that is the software internally is likely storing the data by time. So all the variables at time step one, all the variables by time step two. 
But remember PLS and PCR insensitive to reordering the columns. So all I'm doing is instead of presenting my contribution on a time basis, I rather present it on a variable basis with time changing within each variable. It's easier for an interpretation point of view. So this shows that batch 37 is primarily uh, problematic due to latex density and conversion dropping off right from the beginning of the batch. Okay, so that was the other point from last class. Batch contributions, batch loadings, and weights not only tell you which variables are important, but also when they become important. So here we're seeing latex density and latex and conversion are dropping off right near the start of the batch and, and remain low for the rest of the batch. If we go and investigate batch 34, it had a high T2 value and its contribution plot shows the problem was occurring midway during the batch. So cooling water, there was a problem for causing that to increase. Reactor jacket temperature were increasing. Latex density, okay, it does show a little bit of variation at the start of the batch as well, and then drops off at the end. Conversion drops off at the end. Energy release drops off. Um, I don't, do I have the raw data? Yeah, so here batch 34, if we go look at the raw data, we said uh, cooling water had a problem where the cooling water temperature <coughs> increased, reactive jacket temperature increased. In the raw data here, we see that, that the cooling water temperature is slightly above average over all the good batches shown in black. Reactive jacket temperature, very subtle deviation, but it is noticeably higher too than the, than the base data. Which other ones dropped off? Uh, latex density dropped off at the end of conversion. So the orange line is just noticeably lower here for latex density. Conversion noticeably lower there at the end. And energy released is, is quite a bit lower. So the raw data confirm what the contribution plot is showing. Now, I know that here, what's quite interesting is that batch 34 and batch 37, the, the reason for the fault are, is identical. The simulation was, uh, let's just go back up here, that, maybe I didn't put it down. The reason for, for, the, for the problem is the greater impurity was added, 30% greater impurity was added in the butadiene feed. And for batch 37, that addition of the impurity was present right from the start of the batch. Batch 34, same problem, except the simulation was adding that impurity midway during the batch. So it's actually, it's, it's quite interesting that the one batch shows up as an outlier in T1, the other batch shows up as an outlier in mainly T2. And, and the reason for that primarily is because this is, is a simulation data set, so all the other Trajectories are very, very tight to control. These are the only two disturbances in the data set, and so they go in, in separate directions from that point of view. <coughs> now, the other thing about PLS, batch PLS, is that it's an ordinary PLS, so we also get at the end of the batch predict predictions for each of the five Y. So some are better predicted than others, um, and here that written the root mean squared error of estimation. So this third variable, the branching, very well predicted, uh, much less noise than say polar dispersity of composition. And that's the other nice thing about a batch PLS, is getting these, these predictions. Batch 34 and 37, these are the, the two batches over here in each instance that are slightly away from the rest of the data because they, their final quality was a little bit off. So that's just a, a bit of background about that case study. Now what I'd like to look at is how can we monitor those batches in real time? Is there, is there a way we can look at detecting those problems right as they're occurring? So in batch 37's case, why wait till the end of the batch if we could have picked it up uh, when, when the problem started at the start? So that's, that's where we're going over here. But I do want to just mention this very important type of monitoring up here, offline post-batch monitoring. In fact, this is, is done by many companies. What they do is they'll wait for the batch to be over, collect all those data, 
from the trajectories. And then they do what I showed here. You've got all your data now, which is all present. The batch is over, time j is finished. You've got the data for all tags for all time. You can calculate your score plot, your SPE, and you can see where that batch falls on the T1, T2 score plot. Is it below the SPE? And if, if so, you've got a good, a good justification for releasing that batch to go to the next stage. Most companies, before they release a batch to the next stage, they'll first take a sample and send it for lab testing, wait a couple of hours, and then, then release it once the lab results come back as okay. But a lot of the, the publications, especially in the pharmaceutical industry and uh, polymer industry where they do this testing, they've, they've moved to systems which are called early release or real-time release, RTR. Real-time release allows for letting the batch go on to the next stage based on the data you've collected throughout the batch up to the end of the batch. And if it is show, if, if the data on the batch are consistent with previous good data, you've got a good comfort level to say it's okay to, to go to the next stage. Um, there's one risk though. If you use the SPE and T squared values, these are the SPE and T squared values for the entire trajectory of X. So basically you're summarizing this trajectory for all tags by two single numbers, SPE and T squared, you're checking if they're below the limits. That's telling you how the entire batch behave, but there's nothing to say that something went wrong midway during the batch and then it corrected itself so that your SPE was and T squared were below the limits at the end. So what I'm going to show you here is how you can catch that problem. How, how do we track SPE and T squared while the batch is progressing? Um, so that even offline, right, offline I can go and simulate what the batch batches T squared and SP were while it was running and not just use this final T squared and SP. You're putting, there's a bit of a risk there in assuming that if those two are below the limit, everything was okay throughout the batch. So the important point is it's not, it's not just the end point, it's how you got to the end point that matters. The other reason why online monitoring is so important is many high value batch systems Particularly uh, where I see this a lot is in biological processing. So they'll, they'll take a cell culture and grow it for a period of three, four weeks, sometimes longer. That batch duration of four weeks, you really want to track it extremely carefully. The value of those cellular cultures are in the millions of dollars per gram. So, and they're often small reactors. So you don't want to waste that material and time only find out at the end that your batch was wrong. Could you have detected earlier on and then either scrap the batch early and then start over again? To, or, or could you have corrected it maybe? Is there something you could do to undo the problem? So I hope that this is the last slide of complicated mathematics for today. For your sake and mine. Um, what we're doing here is real-time monitoring and prediction works as follows. At time step j, we're trying to predict what the end of the batch's score values are going to be. Okay. So let's assume we're over here, and we're at time step 2. So we've got data for time point 1, time point 2, but the future is unknown. What we would like to do is we want to make an estimate of what the score value T is going to be at the end of the batch. So at time two, we would like to know what is our estimate of T as if we had all this data already. Is there some way we can predict what that T is going to be after the batch is over? The reason why we want that is once we have that estimate of t, of the scores, we can do the following. Let's call that prediction of t, tau subscript j. So this is my best estimate of t at the end of the batch. If I do have that estimate and it's accurate, I can go multiply it by loading. So this is t, p, t times p or p times t will get me x hat. 
So this is a prediction of my trajectory, of my entire trajectory, right? From the beginning to the end, I'm predicting my entire trajectory from throughout the batch, but only using this estimate of the score. Once I have that x hat, I can go calculate x minus x hat to get me my residuals. Once I have my residuals, E transpose E gets me my SPE. Okay. What this is, this is my estimate, this is an estimate of SPE at this particular point in time, time j. So I'm predicting my SPE right now. One other thing I could go do is I could go say, well, that's one type of residual, just taking the residuals at time j. But another thing I can go do is let me take my x data from the beginning of the batch until time j. That's x minus x hat. x hat in this particular case is slightly different. I'm going to take my loadings from time 1 up till time j and multiply that by that s. So the only difference here is the, the index. Over here, I'm taking the loadings only at time step j. In this particular instance, I'm taking the loadings from the beginning of the batch till my current time point. Okay. So the first case could be seen as just taking that small segment of the loadings, p subscript j, whereas this second instance is taking my loadings from the beginning of time, time step 1, up till time step j. Okay. I'll get different estimates of my SP. This estimate is my SPE right now, and it's called my instantaneous SP. This SPE calculated from this residual is called my evolving SP. And the reason for that terminology is, let's say J is, cap, uh, lower case J is close to the end of the batch. The closer and closer J gets to the end, the closer and closer this SPE is going to represent that SPE as if I had all my data from throughout the batch. Okay. So my evolving SPE will tend towards my final SPE. My instantaneous SPE tells me how consistent are my capital K variables right now at this point in time. Am I consistent? Then I move time step J on, am I consistent? Am I consistent? So instantaneous SPE is every single time step J checking your consistency. So this is this SPE value is going to change and move and fluctuate with time. This value of SP is going to fluctuate near the beginning because you're, you're at right at the beginning where you've got very little data. This is going to be quite uncertain. There's going to be a lot of error and noise. As you get more and more data coming in, that estimate of SP is going to get better and better and converge to the final SP. If I was dealing with the PLS model here, batch PLS model, the other really interesting and powerful thing is I'm getting an estimate of y throughout the batch. And every single time step, I'm going to predict y at the end of the batch. Okay? And that's, that's, that's really helpful. Okay, so a lot of what we're doing here is all predicated on how well we can get this estimate of that score. Everything else hinges on that. The more accurate we can get that estimate of the score, Especially early on, right? If, if like time step two and three, I if I have a method and I can prove to myself that I'm very good at estimating that final score even early on in the batch, I've got a super powerful system for, for checking how consistent I am and monitoring my batch's progress. Okay, so what I'm going to show you next is uh, these evolving SP values and t squared values and, and score values for a good batch, a bad batch, and a batch with a problem in the middle. Okay, so this is the good batch. As the batch is progressing, I'm getting an SPE value at every time step J. I'm getting a T squared value at every time step J. And I'm getting a T1, T2, T3, however many scores I have at time step J. And the batch is 
as, as it's going, I can plot these on a monitoring system for my operators to, to keep track of. I also can get contributions. The moment, if say any one of these go outside the limit, I can get a contribution value for it. And for this particular grid batch, as it's coming here to the end, let's just try to pause it there, it's, it's below the limits on every single one of these metrics throughout the batch, I have a very high degree of confidence that this batch is also a good batch. These limits are constructed from previous good batches. So the fact that it's below those, those limits throughout the duration of the batch is a very good indicator that I could release this batch immediately to the next stage. And I can be pretty sure that whatever lab values I do measure here at the end, they're going to be consistent with previous good batches as well. A bad batch would proceed as follows. So right, uh, right there, we're seeing how, let's just pause it for a minute. At time, just after time 150, it leaves the SPE limits. It's above the 95% limit for hotelings T squared. And T1 is also, even from an earlier point of view, right from time 100, we had an early warning here that it was trending outside the limit. So time, by time 100 to time 150, we've had about 50 minutes of warning that something is tending to be wrong with this batch. By the time we get to 150, it's confirmed. And then actually something, I'm not sure exactly what happened in this particular case, but even at time 250, something was something was done over here and it, it violated the hotel T squared limit and it stayed outside the T1 99% limit for the rest of the batch. It looks like they probably tried to do something to say that they brought SPE back into the limit, T squared was brought back into the limit. Um, but even though these were brought back into the limit, there's a, a good period of time where this batch is outside. So this batch definitely should not be released to the next stage. It should be held and sampled thoroughly in a laboratory. If, if the laboratory can do even more testing than they would normally do, I would have recommended that in this particular case before releasing it to the next step. Uh, the final example is, um, this one's a little bit more subtle, so you can just that one. Okay, right at the start of the batch, something went wrong with SPE, and something was fixed, and, and T squared for that matter, something was fixed to bring that well within the limits. T1 was brought back in the limits, and the batch finishes up in control. So if I just play it to the end here, the final values are at the limit of SPE, it's at the limit there of T squared, it's also at the limit of T1. But because of this earlier problem, again, not, not suitable for real-time release, some extra checking would have need, need to be done on this batch uh, before handing it down to the next step. So that, this is what I mean by the principle of, even if at the end, let's say this was well below the SPE limit and well below the T squared limit, and within the limits of T1, T2, and, and so on, even if this batch at the end had that consistency, it's how it got to the end point. In other words, monitoring these instantaneous trajectories over time that tells me that something went wrong with this batch. So not just the final SPE and T squared value that's, that's important. So if, if you're wondering why these SPE limits are so strange, like where, why are they varying with time? We've not seen this before. Um, that comes from the fact that at each time point over here from the instantaneous SPE, we're going to get a value of SPE at time step J. At time step J plus one, we're gonna get a different set of SPE and so on. Throughout the batch, we're going to get different SPEs. And what the software does is um, it calculates those SPE values for good batches. And SPE follows it an approximate chi-square distribution. 
So for good batches, we take our good batches SPEs, we calculate this, the mean of them, we calculate the variance, that parameter M and V. M and V go into these equations for G and H, and SPE is approximately chi-squared distributed. We find the 95% and the 99% confidence limits based on this chi-squared distribution. And the fact that our SPE is changing at every time step indicates that our 95 and 99% limits are also changing at every time step. Same for the scores. Scores are changing at every time step. We get a new estimate of these final scores, tau, uh, tau here, at every time step j. So at time step one, I'm estimating my final scores. Time step two, estimating my final scores. Every time, I'm throughout the batch, I'm re-estimating those, those scores. As a result, the limits are changing over time. T squared, I don't have the equation up here for T squared, but T squared is only a function of N and A. So the number of observations and the number of components. Neither of those are changing with time, so T squared doesn't change with time. Uh, yeah, there's a, a, a lot of detail in the paper there by Norman Wilson McGregor, but just on this topic of the limits, uh, if, you're, if you're interested. In okay, so uh, picture form of the same illustration we have up there. Just one thing here. There's so many different ways of, of predicting that final score. So, sorry, just to come back here. This tau value over here, I never really mentioned how I did it. Okay. All, said, all I did is I said, well, let's see if I can make the best prediction of that final tau. But there's a variety of ways one can do that. Uh, I've listed at least five over here, and um, there's, a, there's a good paper by Salvador uh, over here, Salvador Garcia Munoz, uh, who now works at Pfizer. He's got a, a paper on comparing missing data approaches for predicting these trajectories as the batch is evolving. And he got, he's got a lot of comparisons on, on the different methods. I'll just talk about a few of them. One option is just to say, well, I'm going to put in my, this is, so this is x mu. So this is my new trajectory. And I'm going to always work in the centered and scaled data. I'm not, I'm not talking about the raw data. I'm talking about after pre-processing. So after pre-processing, one option is I just go plug this up with zeros. Okay. That's one option. And now I've got my full matrix, and I can go say, x times p. So x is now a full vector, p is my, my, my uh, loadings, so I can go estimate my scores at the end by saying x times p. Okay. The, by, by filling that up with zeros, I'm basically saying that what's happening is by the rest of the batch after time step j is going to suddenly jump and operate at the average trajectories for the remainder of the batch. Okay. So if I uh, illustrate these missing data um, approaches. Let's just take a look. So if I take one particular tag, and let's say that tag behavior is, is not bad. Uh, actually, let's just do this. So here, this is the uh, That's the average trajectory for that particular tag. Now, let's say my, my batch is proceeding as follows. So I'm, I'm over here. At this particular point in time, J, I don't know what the future is. This assumption of filling in with zeros is basically the equivalent of saying, at time step J, this trajectory is suddenly going to jump down here and then follow the average for the remainder of the batch. The next assumption, the current deviations approach, which is a very poor approach, and we'll see why in a minute, says I'm going to take my mean centered and scale deviation at time check step j and just copy that forward for the rest of the batch. So whatever the last value is that I was reading over here, whatever that number is, 
let's say in mean centered and scaled units it was 1.2, I'm just going to copy and paste 1.2 all the way to the end of the batch. Okay? So in terms of this illustration, it would be the equivalent of saying I, I type set J I'm over here, I'm just going to flatline, well, it's not a flatline to the end of the batch. So I'm going to follow the current deviation of where I am uh, throughout to the, to the end of the batch. Okay. That actually, let me be, be a bit more careful. There's a bit of a subtlety here. This line that I've drawn here is called current deviations raw. So in, in terms of the, the original trajectory. What this actually is doing by copying and pasting the centered and scaled value forward in time is slightly more subtle. It actually says, what I'm going to do is for the rest of the batch, I'm just going to follow this by a constant offset. Because it's, it's in centered and scaled units. So Selvino talks a lot about these different uh, alternatives here. But these two are quickly discarded as not being that useful. What's far more useful is by using the missing data approaches for PLS and PCA. So if now, we're, now we're in a third category of options. And in this category, there's multiple sub-options. The simplest method of handling missing data PCA and PLS is what's called single component projection. It's a very uh, basic choice. It's the default choice when we build the models with the NECALS algorithm. A far more involved choice, I won't go into the details here in this class. I don't think it's uh, necessary right now. Oh, we certainly don't have time for it either. Uh, but it's projection to the model plane. This just takes single component projection and does the same idea but to all components in one go at the same time. These last two methods are much more advanced. They're called conditional mean replacement and trim score regression. Both of those give very, very good predictions of the, of the final uh, score. In fact, even from the very early time steps, times three, four, five, um, from about five to 10 percent of the batch and onwards to the end, you can pretty much estimate your final uh, score very, very well. <coughs> because what these two methods do is they use the entire correlation structure in the batch loadings to predict the end point. Um, so they're, they're super good, but the problem is there's some fairly high data requirements. That, so you need to carry a lot of extra information. You need to carry a lot of loadings and, and score information from when you built the model. Whereas these two approaches, they require very minimal information to continue. So again, nothing's free. The better and better your estimates are, the more work that's required to get it. Um, but the value from using conditional mean replacement and trim score regression is huge. And th uh, when I'm talking about this value, I'm talking about estimating the score, right? And once we've got an estimate of the score, we can get an estimate of x hat and, and, and SPE and so on. But Selvinville's paper uh, has an interesting detail, and it's really from a monitoring perspective. And when I'm saying this, I should, I should actually update these notes and be a bit more specific. From a monitoring perspective, in terms of detecting batches that are behaving unusually and that are going to be outliers, it doesn't really matter too much which missing data methods used because the control limits that are used in this evolving sequence here, so these are time-bearing control limits, those control limits are calculated as a function of the missing data method used. <laughs> okay, so it's a bit, of a bit of a recursive thing here. In order to set those limits, we need to calculate what these trajectories are at every point in time on the good data. Then when we do that, we, we pick a particular missing data method to do that prediction, but then that same missing data method is used to then go uh, predict good batches from normal operation and then calculate the limits based on good data. So what Selvin has shown is that if you pick one of the alternative methods, you will get different looking trajectories with time, but your control limits will also be different looking. Okay, and likely what will happen is an outlier batch will be picked up with both sets of uh, monitoring charts because the control limits are different as well as the trajectories are different. 
but the control limits are being adjusted and calculated to match the missing data that is used underlying it. So from a monitoring perspective, it's not too critical which one is chosen. So uh, what I'll just do here quickly to end up this case study is uh, for, the, for the SBR, we saw batch 37 was an outlier in uh, T1. And if you, if you plot the monitoring trajectories right from the beginning of the batch, it shows as being an outlier, which is good because what this would have told us is we didn't need to run the rest of this batch after we saw this. We could have, we could have stopped early or tried to fix the problem. The second uh, uh, time varying trajectory was this for batch 34 was the outlier with high T2. And this was the batch that had the impurity come in at the, at the halfway mark. What's interesting is that SPE does immediately show up within four or five observations from when that impurity was injected, it, it flags. Okay. What, uh, what's interesting is how SPE comes back within control and at, your end, at the end of your batch, your SPE shows that, you're, that it was normal. So again here, relying purely on the SPE value at the end of the batch is not good enough. You really need to track SPE throughout the batch and then that will be picked up. Okay, so what I'll just uh, do here is to look at this in the software just to show you how it, how it works. Now I, I know that you don't have uh, necessary or you have the trial version installed. I'm back at the trial version so I can do the batch monitoring. Okay. I'm just going to go new project, <coughs> input data. So this data was on the website from last week. I'll just keep going with it. So there's trajectories and Ys. It's a batch PLS. Say OK. So it picks up that those are batch data. Finish there. OK for that. T1 and T2 with those two outlier batches, 34 and 37. Then what we should go do is, from a monitoring perspective, we need to go exclude those two batches and build the, the monitoring model only on the good data. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Panel, uh, exclude those two. So T1, T2 shows much more regular behavior. There's a few other ones that I would maybe go investigate before I settle on a final model, monitoring model. But what I want to illustrate is the principle of, of using batch monitoring on new data. So go. So one thing is to calculate those time varying monitoring limits. The software first needs to go run all the good batches and calculate the time varying SPEs and, and uh, time varying scores and then calculate the corresponding monitoring limits at every instant in time. That's not done for you by default. So you actually have to go do that manually. So it's up here by monitor, this one menu option we haven't really used yet in the course. So go to monitor, compute batch monitoring limits, and it will go and run for a few seconds and calculate what all those limits are. And the larger your model, the longer this calculation takes. Um, okay, so there it's gone and done it. And now we can go monitor uh, future batches. So, So I'm going to show batch, wait, batch 37 was the outlier in T1, right? So yeah, so I'm going to show T1 and T, T2. I'm going to show 
the hotel is T squared. I'm just going to show the evolving SP. Uh, for the next one, I'll show you the instantaneous SP. So we'll set those. I'm going to plot T1, T2, evolving score, evolving SP. Oh, yeah, and evolving T squared. Okay. So what it does is it, it throws up all these plots for you. So let's just try to arrange them here. Okay, well actually, we've only got two components. So T squared is showing the same information as the T1 and the T2 jointly. So I'm going to put those two together. And what you can go do then is drag this cursor along, and it will show you the evolution of that batch. You can go backwards and forwards in time if you like. Um, so it's showing you here how that batch 37 evolved. So from T2's perspective, it was in control throughout the duration of the batch. So that one is not, not particularly important. SPE, here's the evolving SPE. Again, it follows mostly, but by the end of the batch, it exceeds the 95. So it lands up between 95 and 99 percent at the end. Uh, and this is what I was referring to the evolving SPE will tend towards your final SPE that uh, you would get as if you had four trajectories. Uh, why do I have T2? I I think I closed off T1. But this, oh, sorry, uh, this is the one I'm interested in. That this batch was unusual really from the beginning. So T1 is, 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 is outside the control limits for the entire duration of the batch. And that T1 value at the end matches the T1 value we see on the T1, T2 score plot. Or it should at least. So let's take a look. Um, oh, yeah, from that earlier model that I had, it should match that same, same number. Let's go look at batch 34. That was the one with high SPE. Monitor patch 34. I'm going to look at the instantaneous and the involving SPE. I'm going to get the instantaneous contributions to the SPE as well. We don't need to monitor T well, let's monitor T squared, but we won't monitor the individual scores. So we'll just have four points up here. So as this tracks with time, remember this was the batch that had the problem come and show up only midway. So after time 100, we're seeing it, it show up there with SPE. And what this plot up here is showing is what are the variables at that point in time that contribute to this SPE value. So it's indicating that there's something with the, with the temperature and the cooling water, so reactor temperature and cooling water temperature, their correlation structure that the reactor temperature and the cooling water temperature normally have, and the jacket temperature for that matter, that correlation structure has been broken. And going with that is the energy release. That correlation, all these three, four variables are energy related. Also, there's been some broken correlation structure in the energy. So as this impurity has come into the reactor, it's consuming energy that would have otherwise been taken up by the cooling water and causing a broken correlation structure. What's interesting in this particular batch is as it progresses, those contributions go away and turn into something different. They're now turning into and affecting the latex density and conversion. So just here towards the end, latent density and conversion show up as being more important to the contributions. Actually, that kind of over there. And the earlier problem goes away. And what seems to be happening by the end of the batch, we're able to get it in control, at least from the SPE's point of view. Um, though the evolving SPE doesn't, doesn't, it stays outside the limits for the duration of the batch. But the instantaneous SPE at every point in time gradually gets more and more in control. The overall SPE doesn't. Okay. So, unfortunately, yeah, this is not something. Uh, unless you go back to the um, trial version, you won't be able to to run these yourself. So I'm demonstrating here at once. Any questions on that? Just before we move on. Okay, 
So, okay, what I'd rather do is that this case study is going to take at least half an hour of your time and, and it's going to be interactive in the class. So, did you want to do it? You guys all look pretty tired or you've gone home to go for it? Yes, no. What, this, okay, so let, let me just describe what, what it is and then, uh, then we can. The other, there's, there's a disadvantage as well, again, with this case, because you've got batch trajectories, you won't actually be able to do it on your laptops as I was hoping one, would, one should do it. Uh, but what I, I did was I, I converted these batch trajectories over to feature variables for you instead. But the idea was that it's a multi-block PLS. And as I said earlier in the slide, this is probably as complicated as it gets in this course and in terms of latent variable modeling in general. This case study was the one uh, that I posted on the website as a PDF for you to read. Uh, it was an industrial chemical case study. And what happened is there's multiple blocks. There's a block of chemistry data available to us on each of the batches. So 71 batches in the data set. And the company had the chemistry of the material that's charged to the reactor. So they, I think there were 11 chemistry variables measured for each of the batches. And there's a 12th column in there that is the weight of the material charged to the reactor. So 11 chemistry plus one weight. There's the operations data. Uh, these were data such as how, what is the duration of phase one? Duration of phase two, duration of phase three. Uh, there were things, uh, we actually looked, looked at this a little bit last class. There was a slope of this trajectory the level reached at the end of phase one, the temperature at the start of phase two, the temperature at the end of phase two, uh, the time durations that I mentioned earlier for those four durations. So those are the operational variables. In fact, what those are are features uh, of the trajectory, but they're also features that we use to align the data. So when we do the alignment, those those stretching and shrinking, basically, this, how long was phase one, how long was phase two and three? Because after alignment, every phase is gonna have the same duration. But the raw data, each batch had a, a different duration in phase one, a different duration in phase two. So those timing information represents how much we're stretching and shrinking time by. We put that as well into the Z matrix. So what we end up with in this particular study is a multi-block model with three X blocks, chemistry conditions, operations data, the trajectories, and then a final block for the Y properties. Uh, what I did, I did mention at the start of the class I was going to talk about the alignment for that batch because last class I screwed up how I, um, how the description for alignment. So let me just take a look at that at the very least and then we can decide whether to, to look at the case study or not. So, Alignment was something I tried to explain but poorly last class. Here's a, hopefully an illustration that will help me better, do a better job this time. When we're aligning with an indicated variable, what we do is we look through our tags. So we've got K tags, one, two, three, up to capital K tags. And if we have a tag that happens to be monotonically increasing, then that's great. We can use that tag to align. And that tag doesn't have to be monotonically increasing throughout the batch. As long as it's monotonically increasing within one phase of the batch, that's okay. Because in the next phase, we can use a different variable to align. And in the third phase, we might switch to some other strategy. But within one phase, if we've got a variable that goes monotonically up or monotonically down, or even if we can calculate a variable like this one, energy added is a calculated variable, that measures the integrated heat added to the reactor through the jacket. It's obviously going to be increasing throughout the batch, or through this phase, according to this x-axis variable, which is clock time, the time you read on the wall. And so what we do is the following. We take the y-axis and we split it up evenly, like here. Whatever the units are, I may choose to sample 10 evenly spaced samples for this one particular tag on one batch. And what I go do is I read across to the line and then down 
and down I'm plotting the next tag. So here's temperature, and I may have pressure, and I may have several other tags. And I'll repeat the strategy of every one of those tags, but I'm just going to illustrate it on one other tag. Same principle will apply to all the others. Read across your monotonic variable at evenly spaced samples, and then come down on clock time. When you hit the trajectory, move it across. And you plot in a second axis for yourself, warp time. Warp time is, let's, let's, let's take it according to the following example. Let's say there were 60 minutes going from here to over here. Warp time is not a particular time that you can measure on the clock. Warp time is purely the number of samples. Let's say I want to align my data so that after phase one is over, those 60 minutes for this particular batch gets resampled into 10 particular observations. So, uh, oh, sorry, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 observations. I am choosing to resample this trajectory over those 60 minutes down to 11 samples. Okay? So, that's an arbitrary choice. I can choose 20, 30, 40, but what I do though is however many I choose here is the same number of spacings I have to use back up here on this y-axis. So if I, I've chosen 11 particular data points, 1, 2, 3, up to 11 over here, that same even spacing I just write down over here, 1, 2, 3, up to 11. And then I read across, so I'm on observation 1 over here, I go at observation 1, go down to that point, up across, so I know how far to stop. I want to stop at 1, and that's where I draw my marker. Observation 5, I read across, come down to this variable, come across to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5th data point uh, notch, and I stop. Okay, And I repeat to that. Now, you, I've illustrated here with 11, but usually this spacing is about 100 to 150, because you, you're writing computer source code to you not doing it by hand. But for illustration, I've just chosen 11 data points, okay? So what I'll go do then is, for this one tag, I go and apply this to this temperature tag, I'll go apply it to every other tag within my batch. That's one batch aligned. My next batch, I come, I find the energy added variable, I use the same sampling spacing on the y-axis, this time in the second batch, it may not be 60 minutes over here. It might be 80 minutes in the second batch. It doesn't matter. I still, this is evenly spaced. So I come across down, come across over here. I'll land up with whatever my choice was, let's say 11. I'll land up with 11 samples for my second batch, 11 samples for my third batch. And that's how you get your, your evenly shaped cube, because you're normalizing your time direction to have the same number of samples for all batches in all tags. Okay. Oh, does this make more sense now? <laughs> okay, so what's interesting is you can notice how this has a concave shape has now become convex. So you get things happening like that because what essentially happened here in the earlier parts, I'm stretching out time. And here at the end, with this monotonic variable, sorry, here in the middle part, I'm stretching out time. Here in the early phase, I'm compressing time and compressing time. So this warped variable is just a renormal, a, a reshaping of time. What's really <coughs> interesting is if I go and plot here in exactly the same way, I plot clock time versus clock time. So this is a 45 degree line. It just doesn't look 45 degrees because I've got uh, stretched one axis over the other. But what I can go do here by following the same approach, I can go calculate warp time versus clock time. So this is showing you how I readjusted re time for this batch. This curve, this trajectory of time will be different for the second batch because the second batch I may have needed to stretch and shrink in different time points depending on the shape of this, this original variable. So actually, what's, I think Southfield was the first one to do this in his thesis and in his publications. He includes warp time as a new extra trajectory in his P 
PCA or PLS models. Okay? So you've got your, your capital K trajectories plus one. You add this new artificial variable called FOC time, a uh, warp time rather, to as an additional trajectory for all your batches. And here's, a, here's an actual example of clock time alignment for This is warp time. You can re rewrite this as warp time, and this is clock time. So one way to interpret this, this is now just a normal trajectory like any other trajectory. We go back up here. Here were some trajectories. This is for drier temperature, dry, uh, an another drier temperature. Here's a, just another trajectory. So when we mean center and scale, PCA, the mean trajectory is going to be somewhere here in the middle of these. That's indicating the average profile in time for a batch. A batch that's over here, so one of these lines that are fairly low down, what's the interpretation of that batch? Short time. It's a batch that was really very much faster throughout the whole, relative to the other batches. And the batch up here was a batch that was delayed. In fact, if you look at the trajectory for this batch, see this vertical drop? It's because this batch sat there going from one phase to the next. The operators didn't, tr or the computer system, whatever's controlling this batch, goes from one phase to the next. Notice how all the batches have a sort of little kink here. There's a shortish time, del time delay normally, clock time. That, that duration in minutes is the usual duration for a batch just to sit going from one phase to the next. This particular batch over here had a really long time being triggered going from one phase to the next. All these batches up here had a much longer than average duration. Okay, so these, the clock time variable will often show up in the contribution plots, and so you need to know how to interpret it. And if this shows up as an important contributor to a problem, it's indicating, and like it is in this case study, it does sh sometimes show up. Clock time is, is an important way. It, it's basically telling you how you should operate your batch or shouldn't operate your batch in order to get good quality. Okay? So it's the speed with which you operate your batch is important sometimes. So that's nice to capture that information in. So yes, alignment does to remove some of your information, you're artificially stretched and shrinking these data, but you want to capture that information back again, so you include this variable which, which will, will get that back. Still feel like the case study? <laughs> no, there's a lot of people that look tired, so it's been a long week, I think, for everyone. Um, this case study is, it's, if, you, if you are interested, please don't feel that you like it's stopping you, right? This data set is available to you uh, on the course website. In fact, this data set is distributed inside the software. Uh, when you install the software, let me just show it to you. Uh, here under documents and settings, my, my documents slash probably slash projects is the full data set. All the trajectories, all the all the raw material, uh, the Z information, all the final quality properties on it are in here, so uh, this is FMC probably. So you can go, the raw data are available for you to go work through. Also the paper that I've linked on the course website by uh, uh, Marcel Middle. This one over here, just so you can see it. Uh, troubleshooting an industrial batch process using multiple multivariate methods does exactly what I was going to cover in class. They do a PCA on the Y space, they do a PCA on the trajectories. They go do a multi-block uh, PCA, they discuss the alignment. And what was really interesting, just one, one thing to end off with here, there's a VIP plot over here. There's a VIP plot that shows which are the important variables as they relate to the final protocol. So just some of the history here behind this, this uh, data set, the company I uh, gave the data set to Salvador and Dr. McGregor here at Mac. And one of the issues that they were facing is that their internal staff was telling them the problems in the batch are due to the chemistry of the raw materials that we charge into the batch. Okay. 
when Salvador did the data analysis on the batch, he showed here the VIPs, the most important variables that are responsible for discriminating good versus bad quality are related to how you operate the batch. The chemistry had nothing to do with it. All the Z variables, the chemistry variables, are here with low VIP. All the operation variables, the temperature slope, the level in the tank, the pressure, differential pressure, all of those were here with high VIP. So it was immaterial, it was immaterial the quality of the raw material. But what was far more important was how you operated the batch. Okay, so that was that was an interesting outcome. So I, I read through this paper, there's a lot of useful and informative discussion there. Okay, so that's it, 6 p.m. Uh, next class, the final class, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it as much as you are, is to uh, talk about latent variable model inversion. So I'm going to talk about designing new products with latent variables, running PLS on models backwards, and designing for new products and optimizing processes. So it will be a full review. We won't go too much into the technical details. Um, I will show you how it's done though. And we'll also wrap up, I'm hoping to leave about an hour at the end where we can just wrap up the entire course and put things in perspective a bit. And they have questions as well. Okay. See you next week.